because at the end of your training, only one third, one, one third will be gone, and two thirds will end up in the class. So we started with, I don't know, maybe we had a hundred people at this one. I, I don't know. And I don't know how many, these are called primary flying schools. Mm -hmm. We flew the PT Stearman and the uh, uh, PT-17 Stearman and the PT-19 Fairchild. Stearman was a bi-wing and the, mm -hmm. fair, the Fairchild was a low-wing. And we got around 70 hours there in two and a half months. Uh, 70 hours? Yeah, we got approximately 70 hours there. And then those who didn't wash out there went to basic training, and I went to Muskogee, Oklahoma, where, no, 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 I went, I went to Randolph Air Force Base, mm -hmm. Texas, it was, it was the Taj Mahal of the Air Force at that time, That's right. we flew BT-9s and BT-13s, had a canopy of a more advanced airplane, and we got another 70 hours there in two and a half months. And again, some people were washed out. And then those who were in basic schools wherever across the United States went to eight different advanced training schools. And that's why we list them here. Those are the eight different advanced training schools that we went to. I went to Kelly. And uh, the... Uh, and we flew AT-6s at Kelly, another 70 hours, and ended up with around 210 hours. And, uh, and just as said, our, the, uh, and from there, I went to P-40s at Selfridge Field, Michigan. Uh, just north of Mount of Detroit at Mount Clemens. Is this what you wanted? I don't yeah, know. it's great. I love it. Okay. And uh, during the flying schools, they had metal propellers and they said they were all fatigued. And they would not let us do acrobatics. They showed us some acrobatics and that's all. So you couldn't um, practice acrobatics? We did not practice acrobatics. At what point did you practice acrobatics in your training? Never? I'm coming to it. Okay. <laughs> I just, today I just would be upside down on an airplane as I would sit in there flying. Uh, I got uh, three years ago, I have a friend and he had a friend who does acrobatics. We're, we're skipping now just for fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, does, he does acrobatics in a special airplane made in Germany. The wing is a solid wing. There's nothing holding the wing. I don't know how it's fast in the field, but there's no bolts in this wing. Mm. The wing is curved on top like a normal wing. Mm -hmm. It's curved on the bottom like the top of a wing where usually the wing is flat. So it'll fly upside down just as easy as it does right side up. He also goes in contests against other acrobatic airplanes. So it's a, it was an XL300. So he took me up. Let me do all the acrobatics I did in fighters. We did slow rolls or barrel rolls. The difference, there's a difference if you know, and uh, uh, loops and Immelmans and uh, uh, hammerhead stalls. I don't know, you go straight up the mm -hmm. airplane, I'm not going to fly anymore, tip it over and do a roll on the way down. And, and uh, You did all those things? Oh yeah, I enjoyed it. I did. I did them in, I did them in fighters all the time. That's that's part of fighter training. But anyway, that's the, so anyway, I got I go to Selfridge Field. Now the P forty in those days, and we seen some of them land at when we were in flying school. They come into the base, and they get way off, low, come in high speed, touch down on the two front wheels at the end, bring in the runway, and screech to stop at the end. And about half of them even got the propeller on the landing because of mm -hmm. them like it. Oh, 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 just stand there watching. So I get assigned to P 40s at Southwest Field. Fine, that was only 60 miles from home. Jack Chenault, 
one of his seven sons at Clairsonault was the squadron commander. And uh, he said, fellas, he said, that's an airplane. He has got two wheels in front and a tail wheel behind. He said, you land it like you do any other airplane. You stall it and land it on the three wheels, on the two front and the tail. That's the way you do it. You don't rush in and land on two wheels and screech to stop. That saved our lives later on going to last. But, and then he checked us all out. I mean, he, he had to read the tech orders and stuff, and he'd take you out the airplane. You, the people blindfolded. He said, close your eyes. And he'd have you point to this and that, and ask you some questions about airspeed. He said, okay, start up and take it off. This is after a long training. And we didn't have, I had, I don't know, four, five, six, seven hours in it. And I was scheduled for an acrobatic mission. Well, I'm not too sure if at that time I wanted to get that airplane upside down. <laughs> I knew they, they demonstrated a snapple, which is a cross control, and the airplane just snaps around like that. And I thought, well, I'll do a snapple. I did a snapple. I got 10,000 feet, and I did a snapple. That airplane went every which way. I couldn't do anything. Of course, I'm strapped in tight, but my head was bouncing on the canopy. I couldn't move and get my arms or legs in control. I tried to bail out. I couldn't reach anything to bail out. And uh, I know what the heck I'm going to do. I'm just trying to fight and, and stuff. And all of a sudden, at 5,000 feet, that airplane came straight and level, purred along just like a kitten. <laughs> couldn't be. So people have asked me, you ever scared an airplane? And I said, well, yeah, I was scared twice in the same day, but the rest of the time I was only frightened. Mm -hmm. And uh, but anyway, I flew up there playing around. I was shaking a little bit, you know. So I climbed back up to ten thousand feet. You know, we'll try another. One. Let's try another one. I tried another one. That airplane went every which way. I went through the same thing. I would have bailed out again. I didn't know what to do. I'm trying to reach stuff. Arms are flying around, legs and stuff. And I'm all over the canopy. Keeping stripe. I don't know how you could be strapped down tight and bouncing around like that. And so I know, you know, I'm working all the time to do to bail out. I hit 5,000 feet. That, that damn airplane came flying straight and low, turned along just like a kitten. So I flew around till I got unscared the second time, and I went back and landed. <laughs> That's a true story. True story. Uh, and uh, but uh, I had uh, we had some Stearmans there, and I flew those. And next door to us was a P-39. We were the eleventh squadron, and the eleventh. Uh, I think we were pursuit then or fighter. I don't know when they changed the name. In the fifty-second fighter group. We were the eleventh, and then they had a squadron of P-39s in the same group right next to us. And uh, I knew some guys in there, and, and you couldn't get everybody. A bunch of second lieutenants, and some of my classmates were in it, and others. And flying time was hard to get, so and you know, time I. I Got up there from September the 26th when we graduated. I got married on October the 11th. Uh, that's four days before hunting season started in Michigan. That's all I remember. <laughs> and uh, so I went to the squadron next door and I got in with these guys and I was reading the tech orders and the squadron commander comes through one day and he says, are you a new pilot in our, in our organization? And I said, no, sir, I'm with the next door find the P-40s, but I would like to fly your airplane. And I've been reading the tech orders. And he looked at me and looked on the guys all night. Yes, he's been still studying the, been here studying the tech orders. He says, well, he said, okay. He said, if you can pass the checkout, why, well, okay. So I did. So I got one hour in the P-39. And how did it fly differently than the P-40? Well, the P-39 had that, uh, airline engine is, you know, behind the pilot, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, drive shaft went out, went down behind the pilot, <laughs> turned and went under the seat, uh -huh. and it had a hump, and the 
before the cockpit, just like we had in automobiles, you mm -hmm. know. And then it went back up like this, and then out to the propeller. And you couldn't read it. You're something like this, and you wanted whatever you do. We had a, there was a guy named Hart, Hart, Stu, Stu Weinberger, Harker, Harker. He was tall and slender. And when he was flying the P3, it looked like three heads in it, because you could see his knees. Top. But uh, anyway, so I got an hour in a P-39. Then on, on December the 7th, I was on a simulated, I was on a simulated combat mission with two Stearman PT-17s. We, we took off with, uh, what's his name? Blatine was his name. And uh, we went out for a takeoff and go up to a town, he went there and I went to know on a railroad and we'd follow the railroad till we met and got into combat. And we did that. And uh, when we came back, boy, there's no radios in them, of course. And, the, and there's airplanes scattered all over the field. Well, we couldn't land. And finally they, there was light signals and stuff and they cleared some stuff all the way and we were able to land, found out about Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. A week later on Saturday, we were on a troop train, went out to Sacramento, California, picked up airplanes from the depot, big uh, Sacramento Air Depot, P-40s, and they were brand, and they only came through about two or three at a time or whatever. So I, I don't know where they drew lots or what, but as they would come through, uh, the two or three guys would get them and take off. Of course, the squadron commander and the senior people would take first and get off. When it came my turn, there was uh, 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 Red Reinerson, second lieutenant, and uh, Roderick, and myself. And those airplanes came through with Reinerson and Roderick and me. So. Weinerson had the lead, Roderick on his wing, and I was the man right behind him. And we took off flying, and this was, well, we were out there in, in, in the December then, and I, this was maybe January. And uh, uh, so we're flying in the valley there between the mountain range and clouds around, and, and every so often they're getting away from me. and. We had problems with the airplanes coming out of the depot, and I, I couldn't realize what it was. And I finally realized that on my throttle quadrant, where you got your mixture, your propeller, and your and the, and the throttle stuff, it has a quadrant control tightener on it, and that wasn't working. And the vibration was just vibrating things back. Hmm. So I finally. Like, and, I, and I'm trying to follow my map all the time because I only had, I had about 15 hours in a P-40 then. That's all, and, and they didn't have much. Well, anyway, at one of these times, they got away from me in the clouds and disappeared, and I couldn't find them. So I climbed up to above the mountaintops, and we had no, practically no beam experience. But if you remember the beam, radio beams, are you familiar with them? Mm -mm. Well, there's a, there was radio, like we call them, the, the beams, and they were like, but they could adjust these legs, four legs any which way. And there was a, like this was an N quadrant, Morse code, and this was an N quadrant, and each of these were A quadrants. When you're on the beam, if you're far from the station, the beam is big wide. And during the sta station, it really gets really narrow, and there was a cone of silence right above the station where everything was, was dead. You knew when you hit it. And when you hit that, there was a procedure. You had a little booklet there with the procedure, how to get out through to it and make mm -hmm. a landing at the airport. And so uh, I got out and I picked up the leg of the beam. We were going to Medford, Oregon. And that was east of this mountain range. Well, I got on the, up there and I found the beam, identified it, and I'm on the west leg. And I came to a corner and I you know, identified it, knew what I was doing, 
came to a calm silence, used the procedure and made a letdown. And I'll see an airfield. And you see a small town. And it's basically surrounded by mountains there. And what the heck? And I finally seen a little cub airport. A little tiny cub airport. And I didn't know it because I couldn't call a tower then down between the mountains. To see, so I said, well, I got to land this cub airport. I didn't know what else to do. Well, time I'd circled around a little bit. That's I seen a stream of cars coming out from town to this little airport, see. And so it was a real short black top one way of some wooden hangers alongside the airplanes in. And off one end of it was a row of, of, of tall white pine trees. And off the end of one way was a gap. And I thought, I can't get through that gap. But I said, that's all I got to do. So I do that and again, Chanel. It land this airplane on the three wheels. That's what we beat that. So I got as slow as I could, come down. When I got that gap, I just whipped up like that, set down the end of one way, and came to a stop. I noticed I taxied back, almost blew the doors into the little wood hangers. I, <laughs> when I got there, I don't know, there must have been 30, 40 people around that airplane then. Well, I got out because I'm, I'm wearing a, a heavy wool with the orange lining, wool lining in it, mm -hmm. a, a flying suit. I had a P-45 on one hip and a, and a uh, 22, uh, what they call it? Long, I know, woodsman, so long, on the other hip. And I got out, man, people would cheer and wave and talk and me <laughs> and stuff. And boy, I found out. And they treated me like a king there because we phoned in and uh, Okay, put up the night, we'll be over there tomorrow. And I found where they were on the other side. They wouldn't let me take off. So the next morning, the senior second lieutenant, Al Aiken was his name, came over in a staff car with some people. And they took my, my most of my baggage out of the baggage compartment, took the ammunition out of the airplane, and uh, he said, I'm going to take it off. He said, wait a minute, I put it in here. I'm taking it. No. So I, he said, nope, you're going back in the staff car. <laughs> so that was it. Got over there, and, and uh, that was that experience. Well, we went on up. We ended up at, uh, at uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Portland. And uh, the, from there, we got stuck with leather and stuff, picked up other people. And then I was on a flight with about six different people now. And we're headed for uh, uh, east of Seattle, Washington. What the heck, I can't think. But it's up here. So I'm getting going along there, and my feet are slipping. You, you hit it like a, a channel about stay wide and a little lip on it, and the whole cockpit. Is good. My feet are starting to slip. And I look down. And we have two gas gauges in there, and they're raised about this high. And there was oil almost covering them. So I got oil all over my... So I called in, the airplane's running all right. And they said, well, stay in formation, that's all you can do. Well, when we landed up uh, uh, at the Spokane, at Spokane, mm -hmm. then uh, they found out that the inexperienced screws had filled the oil up to the very top of the tube, and it just overflowed heating, and that's oh. what it was. But it went back and ruined my B-4 bag in the back of the airplane. That was the thing we carried. And uh, uh, so anyway, we were down there for a while, and we took off in some weather. Uh, and uh, on the way out, we had a 50-gallon belly tank. My belly tank wouldn't feed, so I had to call on that. And we were headed on up to... Uh, uh, this was Calgary into Edmond, Canada. Mm -hmm. So we near Calgary. So well, you better we better land you at Calgary. So we landed at Calgary, and on landing, I couldn't hold the airplane on the runway, and I had to brake and brake and brake. And finally, I did. And the airplane was tipped a little bit, and a, a tire had blown in the air. There's enough people standing there said he made a perfect landing. So that tire had to be flat in the air. So everybody backed me up. So this was a Canadian outfit. That's where they had the Tiger Maws in there. And uh, uh, 
the British Air Force mm -hmm. was there teaching the Canadians and the Tiger Moth. Well, I, had, I was there oh, a good week or 10 days, so they had to have a new wheels. They took me, made me play hockey with them. They treated <laughs> me, they wouldn't let me pay for any meal. They, they would, wouldn't let me pay for a drink in the officer's club. And uh, that was real good. Now, am I going into too much detail on this now? Is yeah, I love hearing it. Your, and so anyway, when I all got fixed up, I left and it was overcast, high clouds around, snowing just a little bit. And I thought, I can make Edmonton. Uh, so I took off and I'm following a compass. And finally, I don't recognize anything. Of course, there's snow on the ground and stuff. This was February. And uh, I'm a. Uh, I finally, I, I got my map and I'm looking around. And I finally found a, a like a green elevator in a building that had the name of a town on it. I couldn't find it. And finally, I'm opening the map and stuff, of course, trying to fly and just all this stuff. And I finally found the name of the town. And I'm supposed to be going from <laughs> this point to this point. One way over here headed this way. And if I had kept going, I'd have run smack in the mountains. What I found out was there's this 50 degree telephone swing, I'm a telephone, a uh, compass swing, and that everybody knew about it, but it wasn't shown on the maps. And it was due to iron in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And so, man, I backed off of that, got, got back where I was going. There was snowstorms and stuff around. Of course, I probably didn't have the experience to be doing when I got up to Edmonton. Edmonton was a small base then, and there's a guy named Cape, C-A-P-E, C-A-P-E, one of my classmates, and he was closing some hangar doors. But said so rock wouldn't be in today. And, and of course, you know, they heard the airplane and seen it, and he, I got to land, and a couple of the guys were there. And, uh, and, and, uh, there's probably a reason. Well, then we joined up with other people. I finally landed, uh, uh, we went through, uh, St. John and, uh, uh, White Horse and stuff on the way up. Went up to Fairbanks and, uh, then south to Anchor. The land on Fairbanks, March the 5th, 1942. And I got out of my airplane and I stood on the wings and I pulled out my 45 pistol and my 22 pistol and I started killing Alaska mosquitoes. <laughs> you can tell an Alaska mosquito because it has a spot between its eyes about the size of a man's fist. <laughs> yeah. Now that's the way I tell it. That's the only untruth in the whole story. Went down to Anchorage and uh, and of course, with Jackson, all we became the eleventh squadron then, and uh, we flew there, and uh, uh, then all of a sudden there was a squadron up there called the Eighteenth Fighter Squadron. They were senior second lieutenants, as well as some other officers, and they were flying P thirty sixes. They decided that we should divide up the airplanes and the people, so. Half of us got transferred to the 18th. I went to the 18th. Half of their people went to the 11th. Half of our airplanes went to the 18th, and half of the P-36s went to the 11th. So the senior guys then took the P-40s from us, and we had to fly the P-36s. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the, the P-40, you know, streamline and the P-36 with that radial Curtis engine in it, and we could go out in formation, and if they do any sort of a dive or let down, like the P-40s are going like this, and we're backing up in the P-36. The, uh, there was a story there, I know what you have not, uh, Eleanor E. Booth, B-O-O-T-H. They had had a scramble right before we got up there. And they took off early in the morning and were headed out to the south. Are you familiar with the Anchorage and the and there's 
Knick Arm, right south of there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is it Knick or Turnigan? There's a big arm. It's Turnigan. Huh? Turnigan. Turn is the big one? Mm -hmm. And Knick is the small one. Those were past the glacier. I think so. Okay. And he and Booth got in a spin. He lost control and he bailed out. He landed on an ice cake in Knick Arm. Ice full cake. And due to the fog, they couldn't fight. They lost his boots on the way down. He had a leather, or not a leather, but a sort of rubber padded cushion on top of your parachute, which you set up. So he cut that in half, made some sort of shoes out of it, and he was out there, I don't know how long, a, I'll say a day and a half or maybe two days, the fog cleared, and they could search and they found it. In the meantime, this is the spring of the year, and this ice cake is sort of breaking up as it goes back and forth with the with the tide. And we had an airplane up there, and I don't, it wasn't an 047, I don't know what the weather was, maybe an 049, it was an observation plane. I have flown it. You could get up 5,000 feet above the runway and slow that thing down, and you're still flying, but the wind would push you backwards. That's how that, that's, that's absolutely the truth. And it could land on a dime. <laughs> Anyway, a friend of his took it out there, landed on the ice floe, cake, and uh, picked him up and brought him back. Wow. What, and that was, where was it? So he was flying out of uh, Elmendorf? Yeah, out of Elmendorf. Mm -hmm. Out of Elmendorf. And uh, then, but, okay, the, the 18th, then, when the squadron commander was named Gale, G-A-Y-L-A. He was a Texan. I don't know if it's his first or last name. He sort of became... Not friends there, but later on, back in the States, and met his wife, and my wife met his wife and stuff. But he was, and then we got moved down to Kodiak Island. Uh, and uh, on Kodiak, uh, I was again uh, flying the, the P 36s and the rest of them the P 40s. And one day, there were six of us, I was at Tail End Charlie, two three two-ship formations, and we threw out to test radar, and we flew out low in the water for maybe 30, 40 minutes, and then we turned 90 degrees and started to climb, and we were to climb up somewhere above 20,000 feet. Well, the P-36 had an oxygen tube, the best way to describe it, like an enema tube, that's what about what it looked like. You put it in your mouth and you sucked on it. And so I was using that. And I know it got hard for me to fly in formation. And uh, so I thought, okay, we're circling. I thought, ah, if I keep the sun in my eyes, I'll be all right. We're circling. The last thing I remembered was 21,000 feet. I woke up. I always took my airplane to fly hands off, wherever I was. I woke up at 5,000 feet, slumped over in the cockpit, my ears hurting, and while I'm in a general bank. Uh, the time of later on, I figured out I was unconscious for about an hour or more. And that airplane came from 21,000 feet to 5,000 feet. And they figured that Every time it picked up speeds due to my habit trimmed to fly in the thinner air, it would come back up. Mm -hmm. Why it didn't bank and roll over, I don't know. But that was so direct. The outfit had looked for me, gone back and landed, debriefed and stuff, refueled, and then we're just coming out the airplanes to come back and start another search for me when I came back. It took me about two or three passes before I could lay even land the airplane. Now, out of all that, while we were at Kodiak, I got promoted to first lieutenant. Now, the reason I told this story is I think my handling of the airplane on the way up, the things that happened, my making a, a approach there at, at the I'm going to Medford, Oregon. It was Grants Pass, Oregon, was the place where I landed the P-40, and that, and then 
coming into Edmonton like I did. They must have recognized uh, the other two guys, incidentally, on that flight landed in some hayfield. <laughs> and they were all right. And the airplanes got off all right in the back. Uh, and I just go on oh, my pen. Okay. That, that's her. Thank you. And uh, so uh, I made first lieutenant there. And then we went down to, to from uh, Kodiak and we went down to Cold Bay. We were at Cold Bay, and we had lost a total of seven pilots, uh, seven airplanes on one pilot by the time we all got to Alaska. They had, there was, well, I know uh, Spanky Chancellor, I was name ran up Jake Dixon's tail and found it too close. I think that was a Portland, Oregon. And the uh, Chewed his airplane up, so we lost two airplanes there. Jake was unhurt, but I think banged up a little bit. He was in the hospital a couple of days. And uh, and on the runways, we were going through Canada, and they had uh, pine trees in the middle of the runway. And one side was for skis, and the other side was for wheels. Mm -hmm. Also, they'd lengthen the runways, and they'd cut the trees down at the end, but the stumps were there. And we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So guys landed short, tore up airplanes on the stumps, landed on the ski side and tore up airplanes. And I I don't know how we have, and other pilots behind it later on, did too, and the story was, hey, if you need spare parts, go to the side of the runway on the way up and you'll find spark plugs and things like that. <laughs> and uh, But I uh, went down to, uh, with the Cold Bay, a, a Canadian squadron came in, you mean, no, and they were at Naknek. You know where Naknek is? Mm -hmm. It's the head of the Aleutian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know one of them was killed up there. One or two, I don't have a Canadian outfit. And I know they came down to Cold Bay, where we were. And I didn't have much contact with them. I'm a, you know, just a pilot in the organization, the first lieutenant then. And uh, then we were at Cold Bay, and that some P-38s came in, and some B-26s came in, and uh, the uh, uh, we used to fly patrols. We kept airborne patrol north and south of the of Cold Bay, which is about the last tail end of the peninsula before the islands start. I'm going to show you a picture here that my grandfather has of some people at Cold Bay, Americans. And it's kind of dark. But... <laughs> it looks like the potty. Yeah, it is the potty. <laughs> it is the potty. Hmm. Would that be your grandfather, maybe? No. No, that one's not him. That's him. Some of these. Well, there's a typical tent that we had. That was on Umnak. Well, this is Umnak, huh? Mm -hmm. well, it's this is Canadian. Yeah, my grandfather was Canadian. There's only a few. There's a. If that's the only one he has on Cold Bay. The, uh, the Cold Bay, no, there was a, a Cold Bay, there was a Canadian squadron came in. That would have been them. Are you sure? Was it a P-40 squadron, a fighter squadron? <laughs> yes. Now, got Cold Bay and this would have been maybe June of 42, I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not too sure of the month, when they figured the Japanese were coming in and they were going to attack the Aleutians. That, it had, they, was only, they were the first fighter squadron up there. Pardon? They were the, the first fighter squadron up there. The Canadians? The, no, the, if it's a Canadian... Oh, okay. The, group that well, landed. The, we were the 18th at Cold Bay. Mm -hmm. The 11th had gone down to Omnac. 
And those were the only two American fighter squadrons there at that time. Right, and then the 111 Canadian fighter squadron. Well, I didn't. Know. I don't know their designated. Yeah. Okay, but if they came into Coal Bay, mm -hmm. that was your grandfather's outfit. Yeah. I'm going to look uh, right now. No, no, okay. Now, if they wanted to get pe people, airplanes down on that, four P-38s took off and went down there. Three went into the mountain, were killed. One came back. Are you aware of that? This is American? American P-38s. I had heard. Uh, so four American P-38s. Went down to get the UMNAC. They want more airplanes, more fighter airplanes at UMNAC. That's where the 11th was. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a Canadian squad. Now, this couldn't have been yours. It was. They, they asked them to go down there. And I thought that they lost everybody except the squadron commander. They did. That's right here. Oh, they did? Mm -hmm. Okay. That was my grandfather. So this is his flight log. Well, how did he not be on that flight then? He was. Oh. He was on that. He, they went from, so this is his, this is his original yeah. flight log book. So 875. So this is, he went Anchorage to Knack Knack, and then he crashed on landing. Mm-hmm. So he had, they, and, and another guy, there were seven of them, another guy also crashed, had mm -hmm. to bail out. Yes. So they had to wait several days. <laughs> they waited several days mm -hmm. on uh, Knack Knack mm -hmm. for two uh, additional pilots and planes to get flown in to fill in the formation. Mm -hmm. So the seven of them went on. My grandfather moved to a DC-3. Can you see there? He went DC-3 because he crashed his plane mm -hmm. and so they went on three days later and that's when they crashed my grandfather wasn't flying in the formation because he had lost his plane so he was a passenger on a dc-3 okay but when, okay let's let's talk from cold bay to omnac on either the same the same day or the next day i don't know now but didn't a Canadian outfit get pretty well wiped out? That was that. Was that? Was well, how come your grandfather didn't? There was two who survived. It wasn't an outfit. It was just the, the an advance party was going over. So it was um, 21 ground crew and other pilots and seven P-40s and the pilots who were flying them. So they all left Anchorage. No, no, I'm talking about they were at Omnac. When this one, when, when I, when I'm saying there was a Canadian outfit at Omnac. I, Cold Bay, Cold yeah. Bay. They wanted to get him down to Omnac. Now, mm -hmm. what I had heard is that, the, I know the, the story about the P 38s. Then they set four more down, P 38s. They turned around and came back. Mm -hmm. Then they sent the Canadian outfit down there. And I understood that. 20 or 23 of them were lost in the weather down there. I, that's not true? Mm -mm. Well, how many? Some of them were lost. Yeah, um, five out of the seven pilots. Oh, okay. Five out of the seven in the formation okay. crashed into okay. the mountain and okay. died. McGregor, who was the, the commander, squadron commander, he was the one leading the formation. He got through, and then another... Yeah, I remember the, the, the commander yeah. got through. The commander yeah. got through, and then another guy um, got through. Okay. Then the DC-3s got through. But the problem was, according to an airframe mechanic, the only living member of his squadron, that they didn't have a radio communication between the American DC-3 and the fighter planes. Mm -hmm. So there was no communication, and so the squadron leader was trying to tell them to maneuver out of it, and nobody heard them. So they just... they And they almost cleared the mountain. So the squ and their squadron leader was in that formation um, too, who got killed. They almost cleared the mountain mm -hmm. and just. Uh, Karen has gotten many, many times down there. Yeah. We were, okay, we were fortunate. When I got transferred to the 18th, and part of their pilots went to the 11th, those guys have been flying up there, I don't know, maybe a year. I don't know. And we learned from them. 
and, and, and Jack Chenault was good. I, I flew in several formations I'm out with through mountain passes, maybe six airplanes, overcast. You couldn't turn six airplanes around in it. And I would have followed him anywhere. He, he had a statement. We always had a volleyball net by wherever we could and by the alert checks. And we'd be playing volleyball and get a scramble or something like that. And Jack Chenault would say, Dad gummit, when flying interfered with volleyball, we got to stop flying. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear him saying that today. But, uh, but oh, you learn, you learn from those guys, you learn to watch the weather. And, what, and you could fly under a 300 foot ceiling, which people don't hear of anymore, uh, 500 foot ceiling, as long as there wasn't any fog. And you could see for a long ways. You had all kinds of visibility underneath it. Now you had to be careful about ground rising and mountains and hills and stuff like that. But the visibility was good. It's when the fog and the squalls come through that give you the, the problem. And uh, so, but anyway, when they came to our squadron, the 18th, so we got to get more airplanes down there. So, uh, the squadron commander, Gail, volunteered. My, I was the wingman in an element. My flight leader, Little Page, volunteered. I said, I'm going. So we got six airplanes off and we got through. It was stinking another. And then we got down to home uh, And then I got, I don't remember, I know in August 1942, my I left my wife pregnant, and my son was born August the 29th, 1942, at Pontiac, Michigan. Well, I got sent back. To, well, I was at Kodiak Island then, and I got I come back flying a P40, P36, and I'd landed, and they said we got a telegram in here that. If you can be at Anchorage in the morning, catch an air C-47 that's headed for the States, you will go back and pick up another P-40. Now, I think that again because of my success on getting up there. So they said, now you realize, time to get ready, it's going to be dark. And we didn't fly after dark up there. Good boy. I said, I'll go. So I got packed the B-4 bag real quick, but got in a P-36 and took off uh, for Anchorage. And, you know, it's straight north almost from Kodiak Island. And uh, so you could see the mountains on each side, tops and stuff. And so I got up there, and there's Fire Island, this little island off the corner of, of Alaska proper. The, it's, it's like this with Elmendorf Air Force Base here, Kanik Arm going here, and there's a place called Fire Island. On odd days, you had to circle left, and on even days, circle right or something like for identification. Mm -hmm. I did that. I'm coming in, and they turn the run lights on. I get lined up in this P-36, and I'm about 300 feet in the air, and an Army searchlight at the far end turned on and caught me square in the cockpit. Totally blinded me. I could not see a thing. And all I could do was just go forward. I know I hit the, I landed on the one way, rough landing somehow, and then I could see the one way lights on each side by then, and uh, got to a stop all right, why I gave the army head. And the next day, some mechanic friends I knew up there from Alfred said, hey, well, I guess I was captain, and you know you scraped the P 36 way landing? I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, they said, that's all right. We changed it because the wing was curved on the end and only went back about this far. So they could detect it. We changed it and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, uh, uh, so anyway, I got in the airplane, went back, and they, they sent us to Orlando, Florida for a, a three week fighter pilot training school. So I went there for three weeks, and I got a few days leave to go home. To, the day they brought my son home from the hospital, so I got to see him at three days old, and uh, then come out and 
picked up a P40 at the, at the depot, and we got up to Spokane, Washington again, and you had to wait for decent weather and stuff because uh, a number of things. So Elmer E. Booth, the guy who had bailed out, mm -hmm. was there also. And we were out, and we had a rule. You don't break formation in fighters. And uh, you just don't, you will not break formation anytime you stay in formation. You get the end of the test. Sir, my engines are off, which was typical, and it's headed out of the water. Stay in formation. <laughs> but Elmer E. Booth, we were all flying around. He's going through some clouds, and he said, he was going to the lake, he's going to the next cloud. I said, Booth, if you go in that cloud, I'm not going to follow you. There was a mountain in there. No, there isn't. Stay in formation. Booth, I'm telling you that that is called Gun Knots Peak. Gun Knots Peak. It's on the maps. And I was, when I first P40, I found it up there flying around. And I will not follow you to go into that. Yes, you will. I said, no, Booth. You keep heading for it. And I said, I said something like, well, goodbye, I'm leaving. And he turned and went around. You couldn't see it on the of the spot. Went around the other side, and there was, you could see the peak. Hmm. Well, we got back up to Alaska, and they stopped us and said, stay in Anchorage. We're forming a new outfit. And that became the 344th Fighter Squadron. 344. Yep. And Booth was the squadron commander, and Jake Dixon, who was, I think he had some previous military or something. He was the operations officer, and I was a flight commander. And then Jake got transferred back to the States. I became operations officer, and we moved down to Cold Bay. And from there, we moved to Umnax. What? When was that? When did you move to Umnax? You remember when you were with the 344? No, I don't. I don't know the dates now. I probably got it in my files at home or somewhere. Uh, it's still 1942? Well, see, I, I didn't get back up in there until August or... September 1942, so we were probably there September, October, maybe 42, as a guest on it, and we had new second lieutenants and stuff, and Jake Dixon got transferred back to the States, and I became the operations officer, and then, and I don't know, then I think we we, we had moved to Omnac, I will say that. And we were on the southern side, and the Canadian squadron came in, they were on the northern side. Uh, and uh, Booth got transferred back to the States because he was one of the old 18th guys, and I became squadron commander of the 344th. And uh, we were on that. And then we got... Orders. I had to tell you an interesting. Back at Cold Bay, we used to fly to keep two ships north and two ships south on airborne alert. And when we would come back, the Army had asked us to buzz their gun, gun uh, emplacements and work them over. And we did. And of course, at those P 40s coming in, running at them, these guys got pretty good at tracking us. Well, they bought a C-47 up there to tow targets for the Army artillery to shoot at mm -hmm. the guns. Mm -hmm. And they shot all the targets off. <laughs> they ran out of targets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, uh, now let's get back to Almanac. And then, well, I got orders. Well, I had second lieutenants, and there's a lot of stories connected with the fly in there I won't go into. And, uh, but I had, we had... Well, I tell you, in the fire squad, you had to have training, you had to have discipline. No two ways about it. Uh, air discipline. We had two second lieutenants from Anchorage who had been doing something in the radar business, pilots, come down to us. And they were new to find the P-4. We checked them out. Now, procedure at that time was you, 
come in rather fast, pull up in a circular loop, and put the gear down the land. That was your shortest time in the air at a low speed in case any enemies come around, which they never did. But that was the procedure, okay? And uh, so that was tough. Well, the guys were out flying, in the mission, some clouds and some squalls came in. Very typical. So these the guys would come around, <laughs> they'd line up at that runway, speed, pull up in through the clouds, put the gear down, come out, one way here and there like this. Man, they'd circle around, pull up through it again, and they kept doing that for time after time. And we thought, gosh, we're going to get the artillery and shoot them down. <coughs> they knew that was the procedure, and they knew that's what I wanted. But things changed and went like that. Us whole head, we need to circle around and land it, you know. Nobody's going to bother you then. But that was discipline. And uh, then the, uh, we got orders to come down and to take, to move our outfit to Shemya, which was halfway, I don't know, I don't know how far now. But at two was the most westernmost island. Mm -hmm. The 11th in the meantime had gone down to Amchitka. They were down there. And they were fighting the Japanese on Kiska now and then with missions. Uh, and uh, so we were to, well, we landed. We went and I got 12 airplanes. I'm leading down the first part of it. And we don't went into landed ADAC. Are you familiar with ADAC at all? Okay. A, on ADAC, there's a big bunch of water, a mountain at the end of the runway, some mountains and islands up in here, but lots of space, lots of space. And these squalls, they're just, you know, you're flying there, and all of a sudden, here's a snow squall, just like that, coming out of the mud. <laughs> so, we're, so I, nice weather, we put it on them. Coming into land, and I see this. I got 12 airplanes now. So I see this slow skull coming down off the mountain. And I go, hey, the guys aren't going to make it. So, you know, I'm a, now about to land myself. So, all well, you got time, you block a horse going around, and you're busy getting the airplane slow. You got to get the throttle on, the flaps start shooting you up like that. You got the gear down. So, you're busy, and I'm going on instruments at the same time and turn it. So that's all you can do. So, uh, so I just did do all that. Turned 45 degrees from out there, clear sunshine again. And I started great big circles. See, I'm looking at my sea airplane pop out of the clouds. One, two. I got ten airplanes. I mean, eleven airplanes. I'm missing one. Never showed up. What the heck happened? So we circle around for about 20 minutes. Squall moves out. We put our fields all clear, go back in. Here's a P-40 sitting on the ground mm -hmm. with a pilot just starting to climb up on it to get into it. Now, and uh, that was my wingman, named Goff, G-E-O-U-G-H, something like that, Goff. He knew he broke formation. I'd have done exactly what he did. I'd land, okay? But he picked him, and so he's getting back in his airplane to come up and find us. Well, that's how I just come up. Yeah. And we go into a concert to eat, and like <laughs> picnic type tables where you sit. And at the far end, I see a group, because another concert lengthwise to the one we were in. <laughs> I see a group down there, look like senior, senior officers, and that. And I'm facing that way on the end of the bench, and then they got up and uh, it turned out to be a general officer flanked by two full colonels walking up there, and he stopped by our table with our 12 guys, and he said, who was leading that flight, the P-40s? I was, sir. And I stood up, and he said, don't you know you're not supposed to fly down this chain without a C-47 leading you? I said, no, sir, I don't know that. He said, that was published and went out to everybody. I said, General, I have flown up and down this chain for over a year. I've never followed a C-47. And he looked at me and said, who's your squadron commander? 
I am sorry. Did the squadron command it? Yes, sir. Well, you get on our way. We're going to take off in about 30 minutes. You finish your dinner, you get up, and you get on our way going down to ADAC. That's where the headquarters was. So we did. Well, out there, I put our wings in, in an echelon alongside him. I put six on one side and six on the other. I put high cover, change them around, all of this by signals from my airplane. I couldn't do that. So we got down there, and uh, we landed and went up where we were supposed to go. And we in. The next day, one of his staff officers came down and said, you were right. That notice never went out. And I should have told him that, that well, every time we scrambled, there wasn't any C-47 to lead us. We <laughs> scrambled many a time to bad weather and went out and stuff and things. And then uh, that afternoon, another one come down with a telegram. I got, well, come over as a major. Yeah. So, so that turned out pretty good. When we went out to that too, and picked out my eight best pilots, two to ride in the C-47. Yeah, I had to follow the C-47 and six airplanes. So it was a, a real short runway. The sea and rocks were at one end, and the other end was about a, I don't know, 30 foot deep where they had to take out the musket. And, uh, and uh, so you had to be good. Well, we, there was a, a hole on the, the side of the mountain at ADAC also. The C-47 climbed through the overcast. We went out and climbed up through this hole <laughs> and met them up. On the east side of the mountain, you could find generally a sunshine coming down the hole. You couldn't come down through it, but you could go up through it. And so we got up there, found him. And they took us, well, I don't know, I don't know where, where they at ADAG, you got Amchitka and Kiska and Shemya and add two at the end. They didn't want Amchitka, our people, or Kiska, Japanese people, to know that we were doing that. Mm -hmm. So they took us way out on top of an overcast, way out, turned us back towards that too. Everything is sucked in. I thought, oh, God. Uh, because after we got the uh, well, we're halfway. We didn't have fuel to go back up there. Got up there, and darn the bad too wasn't open on the south side. So we, we landed our six airplanes, go safely and stuff. And the C-47 dropped off two members, of two spare pilots. On and, Atu uh, or Shimia? Atu. That's where the Japanese were fighting. Yeah. On the army were fighting. That was Atu. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so we uh, we did it. Then the rest of my outfit got into I was the first fighter pilot to land at two, and the first fighter pilot to land on Shemya. And what I, year was that? Do you remember that? That was about June of 43. Okay, so the Japanese were gone already. Pardon? Japanese no, were gone already. No, no ma'am. They were on Kiska at that time, and they were on, on at two, Fighting our army. I thought that was done in May. End of May, May 29th. So maybe you landed there in end of May, just before June. No. Okay. I, I, but then the date. I know when our army went into Kiska, the Japanese were gone. The Soviet call correct. Mm -hmm. The other they found was a dog. Yeah. Now, but I heard that when we were on at two. So I can't. But well, I know it was. I'm pretty sure it was June when we did that because I was either it was the end of June. My birthday is July 17th. It was before my birthday. I was 22 years old. You know, they beat you. So, I, I can't argue with your dates there. If you say that's the date the Japanese left. But that wasn't the date of the 28th to 29th of our invasion, was it? I, th I think it was uh, May 29th. That, uh, that Atu was one. The 15th, I think they tried to land and then 
They eventually no, landed on the May 19th. Not on that too. On they, that too. They were fighting the at. They were fighting on that too when I was there. We. We one Lakeside Point was the point, mm -hmm. well, a real narrow point, and we got a a ride in a landing craft over to where the army was, and we went up. We thought, in fact, that was I don't know, maybe several days. It was before, after. I mean, several days after the Japanese had come through, got into the hospital area, cut the rope tents, and anything moved, they stabbed with a bayonet. Mm -hmm. Okay. We walked through that area. They were still fighting the Japanese in three different pockets. Mm. Our army was, and I see that. I remember because I got promoted right before my birthday, July seventeenth. So it had to be late June, probably. Uh, I'm thinking, and we talked to the army people, and we said we we can't go strafing. You've got an isolated pocket, so there's no front line. The wind's up there, you know, here they're blowing this way. Quarter mile over here, they're blowing a different direction. I said, there's no way can we do anything there. Now, our primary purpose was also to defend against any air attack, which never came. Mm -hmm. But I said, it's just too dangerous because our own troops were bombed a number of times. Even here a couple of years ago, we bombed our own troops over in Afghanistan or someplace. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, but, uh, but no, no, we talked to them. And then in September, I got transferred back to the States. And I don't know when in September now, but sometime in September. And that was from Shimia? You were on Shimia by then? Or were you well, still on Atu? My main outfit was on Shimia. Mm -hmm. I divided my time between Shimia and Atu, and I kept, I don't know, I kept two or four planes on alerted Dutch Harbor. Mm. And what we, what we did, we, we, we'd keep them in Dutch Harbor, and I would go in and check on them once in a while. But when they rotate, I rotated because Dutch Harbor was plush, you know, and here were our. In, Tents and concert cuts and stuff like that, and uh, so, but when we rotated them, the guys would take the ammunition out of the P40s, leave it there, and load the ammunition base up with beer, <laughs> and they would bring it back to us, and we would get enough. And just every enlisted man who ate in our organization. There were some other ones there, and I, and. They got two bottles of beer at their meal if they drink beer. Now, this happened maybe once every three weeks or something like that. <laughs> That's something to look forward to. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then more people want to join our mess hall, right? So you can't, we can't do it. We didn't do it. If, there were some artillery people and some other ones who had gun emplacements nearby, and they were reading with us regularly and, and the enlisted men's mess. Well, now I, I know the B twenty sixes. I knew of some of the Canadian losses at different places, but one of them, the, the length of it, at the uh, Omnac, where we were, I spun it at Omnac. So I was out there. I stood right by his body, uh, and uh, but I know of over a hundred airplanes and pilots lost. But I'm not that my way at home. I can't vouch for anything on that, but I can vouch for those. The P 39s came up there, Carolyn. They weren't made for that Alaska country at all. And uh, they are next. They didn't get the training experience either flying in that weather, and they lost all. I had some of their pilots come transferred into my outfit from the P 39s. Uh, I have some pictures. I went to, I actually went to, um, no, I don't like, I get to talk and it brings back memories and I think about it. So if I went beyond and stuff with you. Not at all. I love it. Then. It's great. I, I love to fly. I got elected like commission after the end of the war and, uh, I, they took so many of us in. 
that they give us all artificial retirement dates. How or why, I don't know. Mine come out to 28 years. I would have stayed in another 10 years if they'd left me. And I end up with uh, 12 or 1400 hours of jet fighter time also before I... So why did you retire from the Air Force? Because when we, when we took, when we got the regular, they had to be a board and stuff and get approved and stuff. So this was maybe 1946, maybe or something. I don't, re I don't remember exactly now. And so I got a regular commission. Uh, so I'm still a member of the regular Air Force, just retired. It's different. If you're reserved, they can put you out any time. It's like regular, you're in for life. And, uh, but they took so many of us in that they'd let us all go out at the same time, they'd have been decimated. Mm -hmm. So somehow they gave everybody who got it at that time, over that period of time, they gave us an art, uh, I'll use the word artificial. That's not, that, that's not true. But they gave us a retirement date. Some of my classmates, I think, got 26 years. Some got some people I knew got 20. So none of my classmates stayed in now. But, and some got 27. I got 28. Some got 29 and 30. What does that mean? That to get 28 years, that you can stay in for 28 years? No. I had to get out at the end of 28 years service. I had to, re I, I knew about 1946 or seven, the date I had to retire. Oh, okay. I couldn't stay in. So, but you did stay in until your 28 years. Well, I, I yeah, I, I knew at that time I could get, I had to retire at the end of 28 years. Mm -hmm. And I did, <laughs> had to, didn't want to. So, that means you retired in 68. Well, that's still a long service. Well, it was, well, I love to fly. I still want to. I was still fly. Well, the last six months they don't let you fly or something like that. But I flew up until then. So what else did you fly? Well, I flew the, in addition to the flying school, I flew the P-36, P-38, P-39, P-40, P-47, P-51, F-86. That's a Sabre. Sabre. And plus a T-33. And I got some C-45 and C-47 time. And a couple other odd airplanes. I like to fly. If I can get my hands on an airplane, I fly. And do you fly now? No, but I was, uh, I took some lessons for a while and then they moved the program to be an instructor's rating. And then it's, it's expensive. It takes time away from the family and I'd spent quite a bit away from the time. We had four children and so I decided that was not for me. I, commercial flying did not interest me somehow. I don't mm. know. It's not as free. Huh? Not as free. Yeah, that, well, man, I, I wish I I owned the paper to somebody to read. I, I'd have to show you that someday, maybe. But no, I had a dream time. I ended up, I was director of plans and programs for Alaskan Air Command. I was Director of War Plans for Systems Command when I retired. Director of Plans? Director of, uh, Director of Plans and Programs for Alaskan Air Command. And uh, So you spent more time in Alaska after, after I went the back campaign for a was over? Tour, yes, I went back for a second tour. Yeah. At Elmendorf or where? At Elmendorf, yes. 